Welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your host, Matt, today, and I don't have adult supervision, but today I have Ken Ware and I have Dr. Don Wood. So for people that are, you know, people that are right into sport and stuff like that, they might get excited about sitting around a table with like Kobe Bryant and Arnold Schwarzenegger or something like that. But for someone like me that is, oh, and genuinely into sport and that sort of stuff, but these are my superheroes, okay? So I've got a couple of real champions here today. These are my champions of my my passionate field, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's a real privilege for me to have these two guys here together. So hopefully I, I do it justice. And I really believe that today, I just want to achieve something great because I've got such great people here. Um, and it's taken a little bit to coordinate this because we've got Don. Where are you, Don? You're I'm in Orlando, Florida. Yeah, and Ken's on the other side of the table. So that, the Ken <laughs> bit was easier. But then getting the Zoom to work to Orlando, Florida, that was the challenge. And Brooke and Vanessa helped us out with that. So it's been a great team uh, effort so far. So you guys better perform, all right? No. <laughs> Pressure's on. So we've got Don from the Inspired Performance Institute and Ken from the Neurophysics Institute. Institute, hey, I did that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's good. Yeah. 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 The, um, now... We got in podcasts with both of these guys, so we, I don't want to go back over what we've done in previous podcasts. You guys can go back and the audience can go back and listen to those other podcasts. We will get back to a little bit more about that later, but for the guy, I just want everyone to understand a little bit about why I wanted this to happen today. And this is going to be a very crude, uh, I, I got to try to simplify what you guys do for the audience somehow and explain a little bit about why I think it's I wanted you guys to talk together um, so I can learn and the rest of us can learn from something that you guys can share mm. when I when I spoke to you guys both originally and I hear the way you talk my my understanding and again it's going to be a very crude explanation but from what I, I saw a pattern with what you guys were both talking about where people that have experienced some form of trauma that trauma um, can be held as some sort of a memory and mm -hmm. uh, so we can have the memory which it's and it's a holistic system like so when we have a trauma it doesn't just happen to a part of our body or a part of our mind it's a holistic thing and when our memory is also systemic We'll have muscle memory, mind memory, and it'll come with emotion, and that'll come with posture changes, and that will come with everything. And when I spoke to both of you guys, that memory and that imprintation of that memory, whether that's in the physical body or in the mind, is what really influences the quality of the life. You know, the body doesn't know if the memory's happening right now, if it's happened in the past, especially if you're holding that posture and those emotions attached to that memory. And then once you were identified that these people that have been through a trauma held some sort of a memory within their body, you had a strategies where you could disrupt or distort that memory, you know, remind the body, or whether, you know, whether you're changing someone's posture, where we're using a tremor. So mm -hmm. Ken, you did it through the Neurophysics Institute. He has a, uh, does a tremor therapy, chaos therapy. It's a lot of physical body work, and we will talk a lot more because mm -hmm. it's a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll distort the memory physically. Um, Dr. Don, in our previous podcast, we talked about the way you get people to talk about the stuff and, and you know, using words like flow and then also distorting the memory and chopping it all up to disrupt the memory, again, to remind the body that it's not happening right now. It couldn't possibly be happening right now. And then the next thing that you both did that seemed to be relatively consistent is then right now in space and time, where am I at? Let's calibrate. You know, so you guys went through, disrupt the memory, and then go to a point where this person, you can't change the fact that they've been through the trauma. We can't change the fact that it's been there. But we can distort that memory, remind the body it's not happening right now, and then calibrate in peace in our current space and time moving forward. It's, it's not like you can ever wipe the memory, but it's like you guys seem to have disrupted it and distorted the memory to the point that it's no longer imprinted into this person's being in every possible way and I thought it was fascinating with uh, the way that you could do a very uh, like a, in my again a crude opinion I'm, I'm so worried about offending you guys here with like making it sound simple <laughs> because I know it's so much it more complicated simple. and I know mm. that you guys are going to be 
like I know it's not that you're just working from the head down, Don, and Ken, you're going from the foot up. Mm. But from the outside in, it looks like that's the way it is. Mm. So we've got one guy that can distort the the muscle memory and re and I, I got to stop using the word re as well. Mm. I know that's a lesson I've learned because you can't rewind, you can't repeat, and you can't recalibrate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just about moving forward. So. I think that you guys have something very similar in the sense that you can identify the patterns, you can disrupt those patterns, and then you can calibrate these people and move forward using totally different techniques. That sounds fair, huh? Yeah, there's a few few things there we'd probably have to sort of talk about as we go along there. But as, as Don knows himself, this anxiety and that is just massive. I, when I did a presentation at uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Centre back in 2017, um, it was about how you know, detraining the perturbing and detraining the fear response in the adult brain. And um, I was part of the presentation. I'd Google anxiety, depression, PTSD, and all th the three key words. And there's 38 million pages came up then. That was in 2017. I had a quick look this morning. Same key words: 45 million pages. Wow. So that trajectory sort of is very much in line with the epidemic of these type of things out there. And, um, you know, like we were saying before, Matt, you know, you can't erase these memories, but you're going to need to stop the, be able to have some mechanism to stop these memories affecting how the person functions and behave. And these are power, so powerful, these memories, that even though the person could have gone on and had an amazing life and great experiences in life and all that, this is just there tapping on the shoulder all the time. It gets their attention, it gets positive feedback, it starts to amplify those experiences and all that. And all of a sudden, all the really good stuff in their life just starts to take second place to these type of conditionings. And so, you know, it's, it is about, you know, you're breaking symmetry, what we talk, talk about as if we're breaking symmetry of the system. Sort of, you know, if we had a whole heap of really tangled up fishing line, a big bundle of t fishing line, for example, you know, the first thing we've got to do to untangle it, we've rough it all up. Um, and then start to look at different ways where it's a good starting point and you know but everything is about the brain so in my type of therapy it's not about the bottom up or the physical thing it's all the psychophysical aspects of those sort of work and um because you, know, you, you talk about the flock of birds like you talk about how it's it's all happening at once there's no head and body yeah, it's it, like there's just it, simultaneously the body will respond yeah there's no privileged point of observation the brain and the central nervous system it, it's all it's all connected as one so it's this whole experience and the body is learning, the brain is learning from the body, the body is learning from the brain, but at the end of the day, it is all about the brain. So when we're dealing with people with complete spinal cord injuries, we don't make that famous because we know that the, the shock goes up to the brain and that's where the lights go out and we've got evidence to prove that over and over. So it's all about getting into that person and they were a person before they had their spinal cord injury. You can't assume that you know, anything else but that. They had their anxieties, they had all sorts of things going on in their life. So the first thing we've got to do is get rid of all that noise so that their system, when they're starting to focus on what they're needing to focus on, there's good clean lines of communication. And um, yeah, so there is a massive epidemic of these sort of things out there. And um, you know, we need every single soldier out there to be able to yeah. help in some way, shape or form, that's for sure. So just for the people, so Ken, with the Neurophysics Institute, you do a lot of what we call the tremor therapy. You've had the, this chaos theory, but it's a lot of, can you explain a little bit about yeah. what it looks like or what are you doing in your clinical situation yeah. as a part of a consultation? Well, it comes into the definition of neurophysics. You can't just call you, start using that word neurophysics without some type of you know, qualification behind it. And that's what the hypothesis in, in front is in physiology very much describes that. Um, when I started to go to, wanted to go to international neuroscience conferences and that sort of thing, I had to show something that was different, dynamical, and um, I perfectly understood all these dynamics. The underlying state of the nervous system is chaotic, the brain, resting state of the brain is chaotic, um, and when people are able to transcend that, which is what I discovered back in 1982 within myself and just thought it was only about me, nobody else at the time, um, learning to relax and go slow, that's when I started to see this tremor emerge, which was just really unusual, and I just assumed then that this I'd thrash my nervous system and this was a net result from it. And that was very much a trauma-associated tremor. But in a perfectly healthy person, that's when we'd see more dynamics that looked like a flocks of birds flying in unison. So you can assess where a person's at by sort of having a little bit of a peak, allowing that type of dynamics to emerge where they've got to relax and just let that you know, transcend their normal experience of that. And we can say, okay, there's lots of noise in there. And getting back to what I said before, this is, allows us to then say, okay, there's disease or disorder in this system, regardless of what that means to that per particular person. 
then we need to work through the grids and expose all these underlying condition traumas and that um, I guess they're, they're overreactions to these moral stimuluses coming through multiple pathways to basically induce this state of multi-stability. So, that we so when you say overreactions to the stimulus, we're talking about like, um, uh, we're talking about tremor, we're talking about posture yeah. or like or like panic within the body? Yeah, we probably need to uh, sort of get off the tremor aspects of it yeah, because that's yeah. only a very small component. Yep. It's, a, it's a measuring stick to where the person's at. Um, and there's lots of people who mess around with that and tell people all sorts of, you know, prompt make all sorts of promises about it. But mm. it's really just, um, you know, sometimes people can't, open up like that so we've just got to you know, well, like with me it was like chipping away concrete I think <laughs> is what you said it was like it took so a fair bit to get everything to shake around yeah, a bit, so you know? we know that they're in a safe yeah. supported environment there's no lines running around the room all they're being asked to do is relax and go very slow with this mild stimulus that they're self-initiating and um, in the process of doing that that's when you start to see all these underlying anxieties and, and overreactions to it which shouldn't be happening because of the, the environmental conditions they're in. Mm. So that's not saying exposing their sensory, their, their default responses to their environment, which is what they're doing all the time. You need to poke the system with a bit of a stick to see mm. what's going on under the hood. And then by going through a little bit at a time and correcting all those sensory yeah. perceptual errors, yep. that's what starts to put control over the amygdala and all those things where neurons that should be reporting safety and comfort have somehow crossed over and reporting fear and anxiety and so forth and there's tremendous plasticity in that landscape and it can be altered very quickly yep. under those conditions but um that's primarily the you know primarily the the under you know the source of what we're doing um and then the tremor aspects of it yes when you're dealing with spinal cord injury that's very helpful because yeah. you can really see what the system has actually done for itself capable of doing yeah, and yeah. symmetrical and that yeah yeah Don, a, a, a consultation with you, when someone comes to you post-trauma, um, they're left with the panic attacks and the fear and all that sort of stuff, what, what does it look like with you? Do you, is it, do you just start with the talking? Uh, you have a good chat about it? Yeah, pretty much. I don't get into even a lot of the trauma. For example, I had a lady, she came in and she started to give me this tremendous details about all these things that had gone on in her life. And, you know, and I'm polite and I listen and she's gone on for about 10 minutes telling me everything that ever happened. And and then when it looked like she was finished, I said, is there anything else? Right. And she goes, well, isn't that a lot? <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, it is a lot. I says, however, I learned a lot about what happened to you but I didn't learn anything about you. Huh. Yep. That's just stuff that happened to you. Mm -hmm. And that stuff that happened to you is affecting the way your mind is operating now. All that stuff that you described to me are creating a whole series of glitches and error messages. Your mind is not okay that that happened. And it's constantly looping through it. And really what it's trying to do is get you to do something about it. And the problem is there's nothing you can do. It yeah. doesn't exist. But it your mind in the past. doesn't Right. Yeah. And but there's nothing happening, but your mind doesn't know that because your mind is fully present. Your subconscious survival brain is always operating in the present. And it does that because it has to. It's survival based. Yeah. The problem is is it's accessing old information that it's seen in real time. So Hollywood has made trillions of dollars from this. They can make you convinced at a movie that something's happening. Huh. That's why we cry when we go to a movie, yep. right? And so our mind, our conscious, our prefrontal you know, intellect part of our mind says, oh, Leonardo DiCaprio is in a movie. He's drowning in the ocean on this boat called the Titanic, right? But the subconscious survival part of your brain is saying, oh my God, Jack's going to die. Right? And that woman's not saving them. Right? <laughs> and there's where your emotion comes from. Right? Yeah. The purpose of an emotion is a call for an action. Yeah. Your mind, if it uses fear, wants you to run. If it uses anger, it wants you to attack. The problem is if you think about something that happened to you five years ago and you feel fear, it's an error message. Hmm. So I worked with. Uh, Rebecca Gregory from the Boston Marathon. She was three feet from the first bomb that went off. She lost her left leg and she had tremendous post-traumatic stress. So she comes to see me five years after the bombing. And the first thing she does when we sit down, she starts to tell me about what happened that day. And as she's telling me and giving me the description, she's shaking and crying. 
And I said, Rebecca, do you know why you're shaking and crying right now? And this is what we're told. This is what we're taught. She says, well, because I'm talking about what happened to me. And I says, right, but your mind thinks there's a bomb about to go off. It's seeing what you're describing in real time. And it's getting you, it wants you to run. But can you run five years ago? Yeah. You can't. But your mind will continue to call for that action until you get it resolved. And that's what I take them through. And then what I say to them is I say, if it was Rebecca or you, Matt, I would just say, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your mind because your mind experienced that. It's going to continue until that gets resolved. It's going to continue to want you to do something about it. Now, that emotion makes sense at the time. You know, fear has a purpose, right? If you knew a bomb was behind you, you would want to run, mm -hmm. right? But if you remember a bomb from five years ago, that doesn't make any sense to feel fear, yeah. right? Just what Ken was talking about, right? The environment they're in should not be creating the response they're experiencing. And that's what I call, it's a glitch, it's an error message. Yeah, 100%. So when, uh, Don, when people are talking about this stuff, so when they're talking to you about these things, you mentioned that they're you know, shaking and crying. Do you notice postural changes? Do you notice when people are, are reliving that stressful environment initially, you know, in the initial appointments when they come in and they just tell them their story? Do you notice posture changes? Do you notice that they, you know, the traps might be up, that they, they're getting into that defensive posture as if they're about to be in a fight? Have you seen that? that, seen that? 100%. Mm. I, I've seen rape victims talk about pain in their vaginal area yeah, yeah. while they're sitting there talking about it. They're experiencing it as if it's in real time. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's how the mind works. Yeah. All right. Our minds are brilliant. Again, like Ken was talking about, we've got this plasticity that we can fix that. But if we don't know we can fix it, we just live and manage and cope with it. And that's what the current system teaches us, mm -hmm. right? Oh, you've got anxiety. We're going to give you tools to deal with your anxiety you got an anger issue well we're going to give you anger management classes yeah and what i'm saying is no let's fix it yeah why do we want to have people live in pain yeah. that doesn't make any sense so let's get the mind reset it's just like a computer i talk about the brain is the computer the body's the printer so if the brain is not sending the correct commands and correct uh, information, right? The body's going to get affected. It's going to have trouble doing its job. Even if it's got all the ink and toner in it, yeah. it's still going to have trouble, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once we get the brain reset and it's back into its, you know, um, reset state, then it's going to communicate properly. Yeah, and I'm then glad it's going to be easier. I'm so glad you mentioned the ink and toner because that's kind of like where we fit in. Like uh, I mentioned it earlier that I wanted to talk to you guys because it's so amazing what you can achieve with your body and mind work that you guys are doing. But as a naturopath and someone that provides nutritional support, we're providing pretty much the ink and toner. We're making sure the body's capable of doing these things, but we can't really f change the priorities. We can't. Um, change a pattern um, or, or a negative pattern or a negative posture or negative emotion or anything like that through supplementation and in fact when you try to use a herbal ingredient or something like to modify the way we respond with our mood I mean it's no different to using a chemical straight jacket um, whether it's natural or pharmaceutical it makes no difference so it's so important for people to do the holistic approaches Ken, do you notice when you're doing when you've got those people right in those initial diagnostic cases where you've you've taken you've taken the weight off, you've slowed them right down, you've really put them into that phase of anxiety. Do you find they want to talk about their stress? Do you find they, they that's when they go, oh man, I'm having? Do they have like flashbacks or anything like that? Yeah, they they do, Matt. But um, there's, we we screen pretty well before people actually get to come to you know physics therapy to sort of you know make sure that they understand they're going to be doing the work. They're not going to get plugged into any machines that are going yeah. to do it. So. I understand that neurophysics therapy is about moving on. It's yep. not, not about dwelling on, in, history's really nice. It can tell us a whole heap of things about yeah. where we got to where we are. So um, we, if they do talk about it, you know, we tend to listen, like Don said, being very mm. polite about listening to things, but um, we probably encourage not to. It's we not the core, you, you don't, yeah. it's not necessary. It's like not saying. necessary, no, because um, you're just exciting those same pathways again and, and um, you know, giving primacy to those over the, the job at hand. And 
Most of the time, and I you know, know Don would agree with this, is that people start to lose their sense of self under these conditions. Their world, as soon as they become aware of their anxiety in some way, their world starts to get smaller. Um, so they become more sensory deprived because they don't engage as much as, as what they should. And it's that sensory deprivation, I guess, that leads to a whole heap of other types of things. The brain it needs stimulation in mm. lots of ways, and it's not getting it, so it just keeps going to these defaults. And and uh, the, what we're always dealing with, of course, is that by nature we're designed to maintain our patterns of behaviour. It's in our best interest as a survivor to be able to do that. So we get out of bed in the morning, we clean our teeth, we do certain things. Uh, we're not really overly aware of the pattern that we use to yeah. shower ourselves with and so forth. And But the system itself, it doesn't really care, good, bad and different. If something gets your attention, it might be pain, for example, and your behaviour gets modified based around those pain experiences and you're experiencing your environment in those conditions, you're forming all this associate memory and it says, yep, this is what Ken does now. So it does every single thing it needs to do every single day, creating the same memories, the same type of processing to maintain the status quo. Yeah. And it's only when we recognise that we don't want this and the individual themselves um, and set to make some type of change where they've got to be the owner of their, their choices here yeah. um, that we can then really help them because we, we can't help a person who really doesn't want to help themselves or they're getting some benefit out of being the way yeah. they are. Yeah. So well, actually, that leads me on to another question I was going to ask you guys. I mean, a case, and you don't have to mention people, of course, but cases with resistance to change. Because I was really curious about, because um, you both deal with a lot of really traumatic, tra- you know, talking about Boston bombings and, mm. and other bombing victims. You've both dealt with bombing victims. Um, have there been cases that have been resistant to change using your modalities based on the fact that, for example, Don, if there was someone that had a, like a, a physical disability or something like that, and they were, weren't doing that body work, um, you know, to try to support that symmetry in the body, were they resistant to change? Or did you find there's challenging cases where they, you know, like for your guys, where there people that just did not want to let go of that memory? Because I know as a naturopath, uh, you know, especially chronic fatigue syndrome patients, they go, what do I do if I lose my chronic fatigue? Like, am I still a chronic fatigue person? Or what am I? You know, like, they're very, they're, they, 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 become attached to that emotion and that memory and that event and if you actually take away the severity or if you take away or the the um intensity of that particular event and that emotion yeah does do you ever find people fight against that i don't know who wants to go first. don you go first for me tell me I, I, <laughs> not that often do i have people come that are really resistant i mean occasionally it will happen most of the people are there because they do truly they've they've looked at everything they have found no help um, but I did have, I'll give you an example. I had a guy who, uh, he crashed his plane, a very wealthy, successful guy, um, crashed his plane with his nine-year-old daughter in a lake. Uh, they both almost died. Luckily, he didn't completely lose consciousness, so he was able to pull her up. Um, yeah, so he was really struggling. Mm. So he didn't want to get any help. Yeah. Um, so anyway, f- finally somebody convinced him to come in uh, and go through the program which he did and I asked him how his daughter was doing he said she seemed to be fine we we're not having any issues with her and then um, I took him through the program it was actually his pastor that convinced him to come in his pastor had me come to his office and talk to him right and then eventually he was reluctant and came in uh, anyway to make a long story short what he ended up doing is he called his pastor when he left said that was the greatest life-changing experience I've ever had and he did amazing and then they called me probably about a year later to say they're noticed now their daughter starting to show some signs and so they she's about 10 now so they send her in and I took her through the program she they were supposed to be going on a trip for Christmas on a plane ride and she was giving all these excuses as to why it's not a good time. She didn't really want to go. She didn't like the place. They were, that's what they started noticing. And so we took her through it, no problem. She got on the plane. Yeah, good. That, um, that's a challenge. So what about you, Ken? Have you noticed there's some people that have got these imbalances or these traumas or something like that or these injuries and just haven't been able to get the, the levels you want, you know, mainly because they didn't want to change their head? Well, I know you've had some crazy people come through. Yeah, like, I, like I said, Matt, we, um, we we filter pretty well, so they yeah. understand, and we, we're making sure that they are the ones who've made the decision to come there. That it hasn't been a family member or something pushing them in there, because um, 
you know, it, it, and is it like we've off Skype with them, we talk yeah. about the therapy and what's going to be, or they've come for a consultation, so they get fully, they're fully aware of what they've got to contribute to the outcome, and um, and having that ownership of it, and being accountable. I'm, I'm assuming, Don, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's part of what you're doing with your patients is that making them accountable for their behaviours and thoughts. Is that correct? Well, not so much. What we basically say, we don't say. What I do say is, you couldn't have done it any other way. Mm-hmm. Based on the way your mind filters through your experiences, your mind is going to default to survival to try to protect you. And it couldn't have done it any other way. So that's sort of accountable. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's what it's saying is, if your mind's filtering through all those experiences, can you see why it would be in fear? Mm because it's experiences and it keeps seeing all of this constantly over and over and and what I call the memories stored in high definition Hmm. very bright very intense and that looks so real that your mind can't distinguish between the event the memory of the event and the event itself Hmm. so it creates an emotion to create an action and so they're living with that and then they end up developing like you were talking about can they develop behaviors to deal with these constant calls for actions through these emotions they create behaviors to try to cope with it Mm. and then they become default because once you repeat it the part of the brain that learns just like the animals animals and humans also learn through repetition so that was that's another memory system so if we continue to repeat something our mind is then going to what i call a code it's going to build a code and i believe that's what i call addiction i think addiction is a code it's not a disease yeah. That you're, you, what happened is you had pain, you found a resource to stop the pain, and because you continued to use it, your mind then decided that this must be important for our survival, and it builds a code connecting up heroin to your survival. And then somebody comes along and says, you know, Matt, you can't do that. That's going to kill you. Yeah. And logically, you go, yeah, you're right. It's going to kill me. I don't know why I'm doing it. Give me yeah. the needle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you, because the survival part of the brain thinks it'll die without it yeah so it will create so people will say to me you know well you they just can't stop right away because of all the withdrawal you know the body will crave it and i said i don't believe the body craves that the body can't crave a foreign substance it's the mind creating physical pain for you to get it yeah it's so in fear that it's going to die that it will create physical pain. Because I've talked to addicts who will tell me that they'll get off the phone with their dealer, and as soon as they know the dealer's on the way, the withdrawal symptoms go away. Yeah, wow. They don't feel it. So where is it coming from? And I said, if the body would crave anything, it would crave water. But we don't have water holics. We don't have water rehab centers. Yeah. Right? There's nobody trying to drink up all the water they can get their hands on. Right? Yeah. That's what the body would crave. I believe it's that mind-body connection. The mind is going to get the body to get in pain to make you go get it. So, I, I've, again, probably a crude analogy, but I mentioned that both you guys work towards disrupting or disturbing you know, that memory in order to change it or uh, remind the body that it's not happening right now. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Through your work, Don, you were talking about how you would you know chop up that memory into segments and you know, make them replay that memory out of order and and in order to you know create a bit of chaos in that memory and, and prove to the body that it's not capable of happening right now is that that's was that was that uh, something you explained or yeah i have a, a few different mm. techniques that we yeah. use that is one of them but yeah. the purpose of it is i keep them present and in the moment while they're recalling that information and the mind's pretty brilliant. Our brains are brilliant. It realizes that it can't be here now and seeing that at the same time. They can't be in those two places. So it starts the process of what I call taking it from that high definition and processing it into just basically a regular, you know, everyday file. Yeah. And so that by the time we're finished, so I, I worked with a, I'm not sure if I shared this one story with a U.S. Army sniper who had to shoot and kill a 12 year old boy. And so he was so distraught, he just, for eight years, he just was at the VA being medicated. He said, I can't live like this anymore. By the time I was finished, I took him through literally less than five minutes, the technique. 
And then by the time I was finished, he could describe the entire event without crying and shaking. And he says, how the bleep did you just do this? How can I talk about it now? Why am I not feeling that emotion? And what I said to him is I said, for eight years, your mind has been trying to get you not to pull the trigger because that would stop it. Yeah. But you couldn't not pull the trigger now, but your mind doesn't know that until now. And we just got your mind to reset that memory into just a basically just an everyday file. So it doesn't erase it. You can recall it. Um, your boss, uh, Rebecca from the Boston Marathon, she went back the next year on the sixth anniversary of the marathon and stood right where she was when the bomb went off and sent me a picture. And she says, no emotion. She goes, oh, wow. this would not have been possible without you she says the emotion i'm feeling now is joy she says it's tears of joy no fear anymore it's gone wow so ken Very powerful, yeah. with, with ken's stuff i noticed um when when i went and did your work with you like if you if i had enough momentum or if i had compensation or, or actually with a lot more weight and a little bit faster i could run through these grids and not pick up on a lot of these imbalances the moment that you took the weight off, the moment that you broke up that exercise into smaller segments or you know, working on this end where we've got a, an anomaly and this end smooth, you, it was almost as like we were chopping up that movement through the different section, again, creating a certain amount of confusion and my body freaked out, didn't I know? And then I closed the eye, get away from all the other sensory stuff. So I can't use my eyes to to see if my arm's moving. I remember doing, trying to, you took all the weight off uh, when I went to do an adductor exercise and it made me close my eyes so I didn't have my feet. You know, you got the, I couldn't even tell if my leg was moving. I'm sitting there, is my leg moving yet? I couldn't even, couldn't <laughs> even engage it or feel it. Um, with weight, or if Ken would just push on my leg, no problem. With stimulus, with weight, or if I had momentum, or if I had some form of compensation I could drive through. The moment you confused my body and slowed it down and took away whatever I was using to compensate to achieve these movements every day, every time I walk and stand. I mean, I wasn't falling over or anything. I wasn't anywhere near where these people that you've dealt with, but I just could not activate this thing once you confused it. And then then that process, is that is that a similar sort of thing where we're just trying to get that body to just, you just screw with stuff? Or is it? <laughs> well, for, well, the, the, all the weight represents, it's, that's just information coming in from the outside world. That's all it is. And, and people could sit on those machines and they could slam it through and with five times that amount of weight. But that's just like watching a DVD and fast forward. You're only going to pick up random bits of information. You're never going to be able to tell the story. So we know that our systems are sensitive to some initial conditions that are giving rise to this. So it's like the traffic coming back from the coast on the weekend, everybody's doing the, good, the right thing, traffic's running nice and smoothly, and all of a sudden somebody starts putting their foot on the brake at the beginning of the traffic. Now we've got a traffic jam 10 kilometres back here as a result of that, so the flow of traffic is sensitive to those initial conditions. We've got to try to get as close to those initial conditions as we possibly can. So we're looking at posture. We know that our posture is what animates us and we take and harvest more information from the outside world. Everything biological system in the world, everything in the world has been calibrated to that vertical constant of gravity, of course, so there's a rule there. So we know that that's one only, the only one rule that there is in nature and that's, that's the gravity, that vertical constant. So we know that things are calibrated to that. So when we have, we've done all the EEG, ECG and EMG simultaneously, when we see that person in a good postural state, we see there's a nice flow of information taking place. As soon as they come away from that, if they're doing something, they fall into that protective type of posture, then it's when we see the randomness start to occur. And, and so it's that randomness where there's sensory bits, where there's missing bits of information taking place that leads to the, these false codes that you know Don's talking about. and. Um, so we can only ever be in one of two possible states. We're either in a state of growth or we're in a state of protection. We can't be in the middle. It's like trying to be happy and sad at the same time. So even pushing people into that optimum posture position, that can be quite confrontational for them, you know, mm -hmm. because you're not going to see depressed people walking through shopping centres, chest out, shoulders back, you know, look big smile on their face. They need to maintain a certain tone within their physiology so that has a... You can basically do the math of it. You know, for this to equal that, there has to be. It's governed by some metabolic state. 
And with the neurophysics, we've got to come in and perturb that metabolic condition to get out of that. So we can do the physics of disease and disorder by taking these measurements. This is what the person looked like before. We came in, we did this intervention here. Now the system's moving into a different metabolic landscape. The disease or disorder can't be there because it needs the math that's related to those type of conditions. So it's not that you're dehumanising anything, but it's just looking at, let's just use the rules, the simple rules that nature has provided us with to take some reliable measurements so that we can actually monitor changes. And we need to see evidence that neurons in their brain are firing differently to how they were before. So yeah. we can do a simple proprioception test. And one of the things you're talking about there is that how you lost that sense of awareness of yourself. Because when we are in fight or flight, we become very visual. And um, we have a visual um, you know, system. It should be taking up a percentage of, of the associ association cortex, but not the whole lot. So if you ask a person to stand on one leg with their eyes closed, for example, you'll very quickly see how the dependent they are, over-dependent they are on their visual system. All the things we do, the technology that we're, we're looking all the time become very hyper-visual. Hyper, um, so that's taking less information is coming from the body then that they're learning to ignore, and that's where the problems start to, to really emerge. So by simply saying, okay, let's look at the proprioception, Yep, they got all that wrong. It was all over the place. We can see left and right hemisphere dominance is emerging. But all of a sudden they take their time and they start to correct that. The only way they can pull that off with their eyes closed is for the hemispheres to lateralise and communicate properly. Now, if we look, the elegance of it is, if we looked at the initial sample of what they actually did, well, their whole system is sensitive to those conditions. It's interrelated inter with every single thing that's going on in their system, good, bad or indifferent. So if they come through and they start correcting that, well, now we do have evidence that neurons in their brain are firing differently. That has a systems-wide effect at some scale. It needs to be amped up a little bit more to create robustness and impervious to these perturbations. You know, they do their finger-to-nose thing and you'll start to see their depth perception is not really good at all. Now, proprioception is just perception. It's nested within our perception landscape as to what I perceive to be a reality. So if we see errors in proprioception, we're certainly going to see errors in how the person is perceiving everything. Do we know what that is? Not at all. But the conversations they're having with people, they're hearing those conversations for as they are, but how it gets downloaded into their system, that's where the errors can occur. And turbulence that people feel, this underlying anxiety and that they're always trying to escape whether they're taking drugs, alcohol or iPods in their ears to try to escape that internal dialogue that's taking place. Turbulence is always the, is the result of competing energy. So we see the innate system knows exactly what reality is, but it gets in conflict with the subjective evaluation of that reality. And that's where we've got to get that sort of, you know, patch those things up, get, every, what, get everybody to kiss and make up. Yeah, because that's what we're talking about, the, you know, the body gathering data, and mm -hmm. it's up to your brain to decide what it's seeing and what it's feeling and whether that data is uh, bad or not. And if it's confused by what's running through the brain currently with memories or what's happening in the body in regards to you know, defensive postures and injuries and stuff, all that will be compromised. Is that right? So they're gathering the data and then their perception of what's actually happening in the world right now will be distorted by combination of you know, mental, physical memory. Mm -hmm. um, and that will change the way they perceive it. So having that ability to kind of remove some of that burden off that stress nervous system you know but changing the way they perceive the emotion attached to that memory and changing the way they hold their posture just on a daily basis must make a massive difference just to how much stress their system's under because the body can't afford to wait to see if it's a life-threatening stress or a memory it can't afford to wait to see if it's a you know a toxicity or a deficiency and you can't afford to wait to see what sort of immune challenge or whatever or an inflammatory or pain it has to have these innate defense mechanisms that will be launched immediately as survival and for so for those people that have been through a stressful survival situation those defense mechanisms not only will be amplified but also almost like i don't know what the word is congratulate or so it would be like what are those things and we only survived because you did this last time mm -hmm. um and because you did that last time whenever i get a trigger i'm not going to wait to see if it's you know exercise um shagging or trauma or pain or whatever this stress might be i know i threw shagging in there i just got distracted <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know <laughs> so, <laughs> so um you got, a, you got a trauma there, Matt, that you'd like to talk about? an issue, I think. I think so. I, don't, I definitely don't do all the body work on it. We'll just talk about it, I think. 
<laughs> you want to see that chaos theory? Um, <laughs> hey, I was wanting to know. Uh, I was going to ma- I was going to uh, mention yeah. though too. There was that there's two techniques that that I um, developed and used that can that write up Ken's, you know, specialty as well with doing the body. One of the things that I developed when people had um, a trauma that had a lot of movement to it. So I had a young man who came in. He was autistic, and he got tased by a police officer seven times. Oh, and once? so big boy At, or seven yes, different kept times tasing him. Oh, he was a big boy. Yeah, African African American boy. He was told that if he got stressed out, he could walk out of class and walk around. So they knew the school knew him, but this new officer came in, had no idea that this was, and he sees this, you know, six foot two black guy, big kid coming out of the school, won't listen, right? And so he tases him seven times. Big story in Houston, and they had done everything to try to help him. He wouldn't leave the house. He didn't. If a police officer or he saw a police car, he would just go into a fit. And so uh, they flew him to Orlando to come in and see me. And one of the techniques that I used, and it was really, really effective, is I took him outside. And I said to him, I said, what we're going to do here is I said, I'm going to have you close your eyes and I'm going to guide you as you walk. Right, and so if I turn your left shoulder, then you'll turn that way. And if I turn your right shoulder, just walk along, right? And I'll guide you, and you can trust me. I'm not going to let you fall into anything, but just walk. And then when I stop you, I'm going to ask you to open up your eyes, right? And so what he's doing, he's describing what had happened that day as he is walking with his eyes closed. And when I stop him, he's to open up his eyes and then describe what he's looking at. I see a tree, I see grass, I see a car, whatever. Then he closes his eyes and we keep on walking. That movement, while he's recalling it, was that physical, right? And it really created a tremendous response. We, we went through this whole program. I walked him for maybe five minutes, came in, he was laughing. He was having, it was like an amazing transformation. His mom was like, are you okay? And he's going, I'm great. And I said, tell your mom what you think about what happened to you that day. He goes, nothing, it's over, right? And because the physical movement combined with the trauma, combined with keeping him present as he's recalling it, created that. And I use that especially for people like a car accident or anything where there was a lot of movement that their mind is recalling. Um, The other one that I use physically that is really good is um, with with a rape victim. And what I'll do is I'll have her put up her hand like this and I'll ask her to make a, a box, right? Like this. And she can go in any order. She can go backwards, she can go across. I said, whatever order you go in is fine as you're telling me the story of what happened to you. Now, she can tell me in flowing, I've told you about flowing, where she doesn't have to actually describe the rape. She, instead of saying, I walked into the room, every word would be flowing. She would say flowing, flowing, I is flowing, walked is flowing, room is flowing. So I have no idea what the details are. It's not important for me to know the details, but as she starts to say flowing, she's going to be visually seeing that rape. So as she's moving her hand like that, what I say is, I'm going to copy your hand. So whatever way your hand goes, I'm going to follow you, and I want you to make sure that you're, that I'm following you, right? And, and if I miss, you know, look at me to make sure I get back on track. Make sure I'm following your hand properly. And so what I'll do is, as I'm doing that, every once in a while, I'll make a little you know, and then she'll look and then get me back on track. The reason I do that is because during that rape, she had no control. And what I'm doing is physically with our hands, she now took control, right, of my hand. And it put her back in that position of control and power. Hmm. Now that's subconscious, right? But it's very powerful. Yeah. And again, comes down to the, the movement side of, but, you know, the kind of stuff that Ken's doing too. Yeah. And what are that practical tips? I mean, after, so after we get these people and we, we disrupt it all and then, you know, it's all about then, you know, main, uh, calibrating, never recalibrating, mm-hmm. but calibrating. 
Do, Don, do you give them like practical tips? Is there things that they have to do each day? Do you give them homework as part of the plan? Well, once we do, we work on basically two or three traumas. And once we do those two or three traumas, we don't do anything else. Then I have them listen to a series of audios for the next 30 days. And the audios are designed to work on the behaviors and codes that got built. Because that, came, what I call it is walking out behaviors. The behavior came in over a period of time. So we've got to walk it out and create a new neural pathway. Because even though the mind now is not going to have the explicit details entrenched, you know, in that bright intensity anymore, it still has the recollection of those neural pathways. So we've got to build some new ways that the mind then accepts as the new behavior, the new code. And it's a lot easier to do it because it's not getting activated by the old memory anymore. Mm -hmm. And after 30 days, most times it doesn't take 30 days, they've now built that new neural pathway. That's brilliant. And it happens quick, hey? Even your stuff, Ken, I noticed when you're in there. I mean, the first time we went there, we had that one lady that we were chatting to with a scoliosis and five days, she was only there for five days and totally went the whole body went straight but even when we were doing things together you know like I closed my eyes I couldn't stand on one foot without falling over um it was only like a couple of minutes later I'm there pretty much like karate kid just doing these moves like <laughs> it was um it's amazing how quickly the body right. can change but for so many things in our life you get this belief that's just months and months of just you know, pushing stuff through in it. You've got to do everything with intensity and angst, but you guys seem to make change quite quickly when you take all that away. Mm. That's right. Um, Matt, I mean, it's, it's easier for us to maintain our existing patterns of behaviour than what it is to adopt new ones. So that's just nature with laws of energy conservation. Water will run downhill until it finds its lowest energy state, of course, at the bottom of the hill. And for us, it's those existing patterns of behaviour. So, you know, the therapy, it's, I describe it like a two-bowl sink. Um, over in this sink, you know, if you had a golf ball in there, you could flick that golf ball around as much as you like. The attractor is that plug hole. And so that's, you could say, well, that's our existing patterns of behavior. Something has got to come into that sink to be able to perturb that enough to be able to jump out into this. So enough energy has got to get in there to get the escape velocity to get over here. Once we got it over there, and that's great. We're out of that, that space, mm. but it's got to stay there. Yeah. So we've got to have a program then that's got to somehow modify the shape of that sink to make it less likely that if another hit comes along this way, that it's not going to jump back into that, that landscape. So that's metaphorically speaking. Yeah. And then that's good. So the program that we have is sort of does that, gets that bit of robustness. But then that's not really creative. You know, it hasn't got many degrees of freedom. So then we have the program build. So now we've got a walk type of shape mm. coming in. So lots of degrees of freedom. So if a hit comes in here, the ball's going to jump over here. But it's still within that desirable landscape. You know, so having those visual things and giving people incentive to go through all the different seven stages of the program, helping to become much more robust out in their real world. So it's not just about what happens there. Everything is there. has got to be transferable into the real world. And life's going on. Other stresses mm. are coming along all the time. Um, so it's not just dealing with what's, what's happened to them. It's like, what, how are you going to deal with this bigger, stronger, faster world moving forward? Because it's got teeth as yeah. well, you know? So we've got to have that sense of robustness. And that's when I'll use things like the flocks of birds flying in, in unison. I mean, they're, they're doing that to beautiful patterns of behavior. They're doing that to avoid a predator that's flying around up there. But if the predator comes into the flock, the flock will split apart and then it'll come back together again. So it's very impervious to those perturbations. So we call that, you know, it's a very stable type of system, very robust system. And we need to have some type of way of identifying that within ourselves, you know. So how can I take a perturbation from the environment and remember that the stress that they're receiving through their somatosensory system, that just gets integrated in their, in, within their association cortex, so sight, sound, touch and smell, it's all one big flow of information. So if a person was doing a leg press, for example, they're just having that environmental experience, and if we come up and with their eyes closed and we come up and bump that machine suddenly, what would be their reaction? Well, in day one, they would probably send them through the roof. Yeah. But as the days go on, they could have even more significant stress on that, more yeah. information coming in. Go and bump the machine, it would go relatively unnoticed. So yeah, yeah. say, okay, now we're much more psychophysically impervious to those perturbations. And that whole thing about being able to transfer that out in the real world, monitor your behavior. What are you like when you're driving through the traffic? Your system 
doesn't know why you suddenly got annoyed because a person cut in front of you. But it certainly knows how it biochemically and hormonally deals with all those sort of things. Yeah. So all those little shocks that we give ourselves for no particular real reason. You know, getting angry, you become that uh, those little things. You become the victim of your own animosity in that in that sense. So it's, it's um, teaching them to look at all the different triggers that can be eliciting all these other types of undesirable patterns of behaviour, and, and getting that sen great sense of control and authority. So you've got to use that executive function to be able to maintain that sense of self, that sense of authority over everything, um, and we've got to start to be able to visualise that in real time. And when Don taking people out into the into the field to walk them around it's perception action and cognition yeah they all have to line up at the same time to be able to, to be effective we need we're always perceiving our, our world of course we need to be acting upon that in some way where there's some type of stressor occurring yeah. and then we need to be able to cognitively manipulate what that outcome is going to be so um having some type of method that enables us to do that is is the desirable thing to do but it's all about moving on and then what's happening in the future when you get your next big red light how are you going to be able to deal with that yeah you know, so yeah. well that's what i was one i was going to ask you guys next was that you know like um you see it on the movies all the time that something happens and they go oh i've got to go back to my therapist to talk about it you know you'll see this so some people get into these habits of feeling that they need a a, a, you know, a, a psychologist, well, not really psychologists because they don't talk about the body anymore, but the, the, the people that they talk to, the shrinks, um, they want to go and talk to them and just go and talk to them. And then they, every time something happens, they go talk to them. And then, then the psychologist, just like a naturopath may explain your symptom picture through biochemistry, so like, we know where those symptoms are coming from. I can explain the chemicals that create those symptoms, you know. But And the psychiatrist might explain why you feel that way. But they got to keep bloody going back and all they're doing is talking about stuff i mean do you find that the people that come and see you after they've gone through your programs and another an event may happen um do you find that they have learnt the tools that they need to actually manage that event and don't have to just keep coming every time something happens they don't have to come back and go through the same process you're teaching them something real who wants to go? Uh, I'm terrible uh, yeah, at this that's question stuff, aren't I? <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. I get it. Um, no, that once they've gone through our program, they're still going to, like Ken was talking about a little earlier, life's still going to keep coming at you. So there's going to be little things that are coming. But after we've cleared this tranche of all these other traumas, that's no longer now going to be filtered through. So they now are so much stronger to be able to deal with a new stress that comes into their lives that very, very seldom will they have to come back because I give them other tools that they can use. One of the other tools is during our session, we create a visual symbol. So for example, what I'll say is, tell me about a time then you were outdoors, you were somewhere in nature, you just saw something that was just so beautiful, it took your breath away. And they'll describe a particular time in their life. And what I say is, at that moment, you were completely balanced. Your mind and body were in complete homeostasis, complete balance. That was perfect. So what I'd like you to do now, as you remember that time, your mind will do this perfectly for you. Let's have your mind create a symbol that represents that. And the symbol could be a wild animal, it could be a scene, whatever comes to your mind. And it's amazing. I, my symbol came up was a golden hawk. And I had no idea why I picked a golden hawk because that didn't make any sense to me at the time, but I knew to trust it. And it was about four months later that I remembered that when I was in elementary school, the very first team I ever played on were called the golden hawks. Huh. So there must have been that time in my life where I experienced something special. Maybe I realized I'm a pretty good athlete or I had a great experience. So my mind connected up that event, right, with that symbol. So now I use my symbol if ever, so when I golf, I'm a golfer now. So when I'm out on the golf course, I have my visual symbol. I have a personal statement, which is my audio version of that. And then I also have a kinesthetic touch. So my personal statement is, let's do this, right? And then I touch right above my eye. That combination of those three things, I instantly feel peace. Ah. And I've trained my mind that that's, those are my tools. So whenever anything happens, when people go through, after going through our program, they now have those tools to come back into balance. 
And then the mind feels so safe in that state that it can deal with whatever's happening now. Oh, that's really cool. That's it. Do you, what about you, Ken? Do you give, you give the guys the homework? And the, I know. Yeah, we don't. Um, well, hopefully we've done our work good enough, you know, that yeah. they, they don't need to come back. And so, you know, it's, it's sort of, that's what we'd like to see. I mean, we keep in contact with people. With Skype's helping them to get through their yeah. program. But once they graduate from that, um, they're pretty home free. And, um, you know, we had uh, one incident where a young physiotherapist had come over from the Netherlands. Um, she turned, in a, turned up in a wheelchair, so that was all, you know, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and so forth. Um, she's gone back to, um, to, went back to the Netherlands, and now she's back out in Australia working as a physiotherapist, playing hockey and all those sort of things. And she comes and visits, but, you know, it, it sticks. It has that stickability, what we call the laminarity of how stickability yeah, how sticky yeah. is this stuff. So, um, but that in- requires them to do work yes. and making sure that they don't let themselves slip back into that state because there still can be that possibility there if they want, if they allow that to. Um, but yeah, so those type of um, incidences where you know we hear the stories that get back to us and they tell us how they're, they're achieving all these wonderful things you know, in life now, which is which is great, and that's what we want. And I wanted that right from the very beginning, all mm. those years ago, to develop that program that could have that after what we call that a whole residual effect. So yeah. even if they're not really doing it, they've been away from it long enough where it's not likely their system has learned to prioritize about other things that are much more important to it. Like I said, the memories never get erased from there, but they mm. certainly those memories, um, stop those memories from affecting the behavior. Um, I think it's when people try to erase memories, just getting onto that point, um, that's then where the trouble starts because you know, where I, I describe that whole network, it's a beast, one big network and it's got a, lots of little grids in there. And if it's a, a metal type of network, if you put electrical charge at one part, every single part of that would light up. So that's the whole person's life narrative that's in that network. So you can't go in there and take one little piece out without affecting all the other things. So even all the good things that have happened in their life, you start taking that away, now you're going to start destabilising. So all of a sudden they mightn't feel so nice about their partner that they've been with for 20 years because there's been some type of, the plug's been pulled in some way. So every single part of that grid grid is sensitively dependent on all other parts for its overall stability of that person's life. So, like I said, it's just when they get prioritised, so the way that neurons will actually work, that you know, you're altering the synapses and everything, so that the synapses that are closer to the soma of the cell, they're the ones that are going to get priority, and all you're doing is shuffling them around, so that now this is what the priorities are for the person's system. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so we sort of making sure, and we, we, before they go back, because most of my patients do come from overseas, so we've got a, you know, in that month or six weeks that they're out here, we make sure that they've got all those tools to go back with so they can maintain their programs and, and carry on from yeah. there. And in that big network of you know, what I would describe as the symptom picture, mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> all the signs and symptoms, so within that network, a handy tool that you definitely seem to do is give them some sort of objective markers so they can assess to see if they're in balance or not. Mm-hmm. You know, doing those, we're just working through those grids, those proprioceptive stuff. For me personally, um, one of the patterns that I noticed was up on the balls of my feet or onto my heels and the funny thing is is I used to have a major problem with public speaking and you know a lot of anxiety and nerves and that sort of stuff and you made me aware of that that very simple process of am I about to my body trying to make me run and flee am I on the balls of my feet or am I standing my ground confidently mm-hmm. on my heels and a little technique that I can do when I feel the, the traps coming up and the sweat and the, and the frown and you know, they, they get that anxiety coming on from public speaking and that sort of stuff is that pushing down of the heels into the ground is a little, it's a funny, it's amazing for me how that, uh, that observation in my body will know if I'm actually what almost I feel as though I can tell if I'm in fight or flight mode or not just purely by where my centre of gravity is. Mm. Am I about to launch off an attack or am I kind of cool to stand here, stand my ground confidently in my space and time right now? Mm. And that little movement there was an objective marker that I can use rather subjectively I think, you know, something's not quite right. That was pretty useless. Objectively having some data that I could go back to to go, no, I'm definitely feeling like there's something happening here. And then some practical tips where I can re- recalibrate and reset that um both of you guys have also done a fair bit with elite athletes and entrepreneurs and that sort of stuff have you noticed any real wicked patterns that you've noticed like for example i know you've done a fair bit with the red bull guys and that sort of stuff i'm assuming 
they're just not scared of anything or do, when they survive something stupid do they honestly just forget it like are they how what how are these guys do have you noticed any patterns with these elite athletes especially like those extreme dudes you know that do the big wave surfing and then the the planes and all that sort of weird stuff you noticed anything well they, they only come to us when something's broke oh, i suppose <laughs> so, yeah yeah so um <laughs> You know, and then of course it's not just a, it's not just that simple matter of trying to repair that at that mechanical level. It's like, you know, dealing with all the other things that are going on as well in their lives. And um, so, you know, again, it's not having a bias about who they are or what they represent mm. or anything like that. It's the rules are the same. You know, so yep. it doesn't matter whether a lead athlete or an entrepreneur or, you know, um, you know, Mother Mary or anybody like that that comes yeah. into into the place. It's just simply, okay, let's just go and have a look at what's going on. And you can start to see where all the glitches appear and the physiology or, you know, in, the, in their anxieties that start to emerge under, underneath it. And, um, you know, so with, with all that noise has got to, got to go in yeah. some way, shape or form. And um, usually with you know, a lot of those people where it's just been push, 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 you know, no pain, no gain, they start to ignore information coming from their body and they pay the consequences for that. And when you put those them into that like, typical leg press their you know, feet apart where they've got their knees and they're quite vulnerable because their groin is that vulnerable area so if something comes in i'm going to close my legs very quickly so you and you start to see how poised on the edge they are now they could put 200 kilos on there and smash that up and down and you wouldn't see a thing yeah take all that weight off and just start to go slowly and that's when you very quickly see how poised on the edge they are yeah and, right um, you know, and that's so how they're behaving at this macro level is very sensitive to those those conditions, and all it is a matter of like, okay, let's just go through that and calm it down. You'll see they'll get to the bottom of there, they'll start to come back up, they'll feel that anxiety, and then they typically want to go fast to get rid of that, and that just shows you that their behaviour is being driven by underlying anxieties. Yeah, and they, you know, really the realization anxiety can't hurt you. We we need anxiety to help us to make better decisions about stuff. It's, it's when we're trying, we just need to be in control of it. Yeah. So they're going to go through. Do you find they're better at that? Are like the elite athletes, are they better uh, at control and that? They, that used yeah, to trying to get things done fast and, yeah. and get things their own way. That can be highly confrontational for them. And as the program develops, where they're getting onto level six, where they've got to do 30 repetitions like that, five yeah. seconds up and five seconds down, they get to learn a lot about themselves in terms of impatience, oh my God, I'm only up to 15, I've got all this way to go, and yeah. all this other anxiety starts to emerge over a period of time. So, you know, explain to them, nothing can happen at, at time 17 that wasn't there at time one. We, we just got to run that program longer until it starts to, it starts to show. So yeah. we need to be able to get at least 30 to be able to say, yep, no matter where I look at this system, if I was in another room monitoring their arousal, I wouldn't know whether they're on the, the pec fly, the leg press. Yeah. I wouldn't know whether they're pushing it up, up or, or taking down. it down. So they've got this seamless, they've got their bandwidth of emotional responses to things in a, in a very steady state. Yeah. Typically, human beings are the only animals that do this. So typically a human being might lift a weight and they go, mm, whew, mm, whew. <laughs> We don't experience life like that. It's, everything in nature is seamless. So here we've got this human characteristic that does this sort of, so we all of a sudden we're experiencing life as a stress, emotional withdrawal, stress, and that's exactly what the data looks like when yeah. you're doing those things. But what happens is that when you're seeing these moments when they're doing that, you see that on the transition part where they're going from the concentric phase to the eccentric, there's a part there where nothing's actually happening. Likewise, when they're doing that other trend, there's a part there where nothing's happening. So they're building all these anomalies into their system. Yeah. Then their system's got to work really hard trying to normalize it once it leaves the gym. So, or whatever they're doing in, in terms of that. So they've got to learn to keep that bandwidth. So we've got to apply that stress where they've got to show no discrimination between stress coming into their system and stress leaving their system, getting less in their system. So again, if I was monitoring their arousal in another room, I shouldn't know whether yeah. that's being applied or it should come into a very neat bandwidth. So the learning how to control arousal like that is very important. And then we see these lead athletes, they've performed incredibly and they've done incredible things. Yeah. But they can perform a lot better if they learn better control skills. Over yeah. that. Um, you know, so you're not going to see the sprinters lining up at the 100 metre final at the, the Olympic Games, those men and women. You know, they, you watch their behaviour, they're calming themselves right down. They have to yeah. be so in the zone that when that start signal goes, they've got to respond to that in about 15 to 16 milliseconds. The startle time of the average person is about 50 to 80 milliseconds, so you know what that would cost in a 100-metre final. 
But when you see them running in slow motion, which is absolute maximum human effort, we everybody agrees with that. You'll see their jaws relaxed. And yeah, they're all floppy. Everything and just flows. Yeah. So they know that the more calm and composed they are, the more, more energy they can release into the ground, the more they're going to project themselves forward, but they perform better. Yeah. If you had asked that athlete at the end of the show, what's it feel like to, you know, we just won the gold medal Olympic Games, they know what to say to satisfy public curiosity. Yeah. But to them, they're just in that zone. Yeah. Everything just became an unfolding of that event. They were already there, the visualisation had occurred, and everything just unfolded because they of that composure. Yeah. And... Um, you know, on playing golf, a lot of admiration for you playing golf. <laughs> it's something that you, you've got to really have that you know, level of composure about. And yeah, so that's insanely like you're developing some control skills to maintain yeah. yourself in some steady state. Yeah. Yeah, well, because as a naturopath, uh, you, know, you could go through the filing cabinet and you wouldn't pick which one were the elite athletes. I mean, they'd have the same problems with sleep and bowels and uh, the same sort of complaints and that sort of stuff. They just seem to achieve greater things. I was just curious if there was anything that you guys noticed. So about you, Don, have you noticed anything with the highly successful elite athletes or entrepreneurs? Do they have this ability to not hold trauma or like how do they deal with it? You know, imagine a salesman that gets rejection over rejection after rejection that just turns up and does it again. How are they not <laughs> holding on to they're issues? Ju- they're, just, they're just better at managing it. Yeah. They, they're still dealing with it, but they've learned how to manage it better. What we do with our program, similar to what Ken was talking about, we get them back into that state where they're actually calm into that alpha brainwave state. So their brain's oscillating at such a peaceful state. They're the, and I talk about it in our program, that the earth resonates at a 7.8 hertz. That's the electromagnetic energy of the earth, wow. right? That's the low range of alpha state. So our goal is to get them as close to that state because then they're completely grounded. Yeah, wow. And when they're grounded, right, and their brain feels that sense and that energy, then everything calms down and the energy becomes available that they were looking for. So when you take, I, I worked with a, a guy, Tim Johnson, who was a former NFL player. He played for the Washington Redskins and won a Super Bowl. He went through our program. What he said to me, he goes, he says, can you imagine what would happen when you give an elite athlete that edge, right? We're, we're fine tuning, right? There's mm-hmm. such great athletes all we have to do is give them that little tiny tweak, right? And that's the difference between first and third. Yeah. And so I, I worked last year at the Spartan World Championships. Yeah. And Rob Killian. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you that's where we met. Yeah, that's, what... that's right. So Rob Killian <laughs> went through our program on Friday, right? Runs in the race on Sunday and wins the World Championship. Yep. Yep. And beat the guy who was supposed to be unbeatable by yeah. over a minute. Yep. And I claim that victory is ours because we gave him a pain relief liniment <laughs> that worked in the snow. Oh, And so, like, okay. I mean, we can share the glory on that. Rob, we'll share I mean, it. We'll share Rob, it. Rob, he should feel lucky to take any of that credit. Mm. It's pretty much uh, us. I know. But really? That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, if, what, what you guys are saying, and this is the other thing I, I talk about a lot, it's not always about the intensity or the aggression at which we push the throttle. You know, what I noticed with a lot of the elite athletes and the most successful people is they've got less handbrakes. You know, so they know how to remove those handbrakes. So that way when you make those slight tweaks, you know, with a stimulation or with that, just give them that extra bit, they've got less handbrakes holding them back and they are capable of achieving more. Um, you just well, managed like, to well, drop like Mar- them. Yeah, like Marco Chisetto. Did I tell you about Marco? No. Marco is a, he's from Kenya. He got a scholarship to the University of Alaska, him and his cousin. They were marathon runners. And his cousin committed suicide there. And Marco was so distraught that he tried to take his own life. And he ended up passing out in the snow for like three days. They ended up having to amputate his legs below the knees. And so he had to learn not only to walk again, but then he started to want it to run again. So they made special blades for him. Oh. And so Marco, you know, was running on these blades and he's a pretty good athlete. He got some pretty good success. But they called me and they said, we, he's plateaued. No matter what we're doing, we're not getting him to that next level. We think he's a potential Olympic hopeful, right? But something we believe it's really in his mind. So Marco came in to see me. This is last year. He came in to see me, I think around February or March. And I took him through the program. Nine days later, he runs in a marathon and took 15 seconds per mile off his time. Oh, wow. 
And at that level, at that elite level, that was a big jump. <laughs> and then a few yeah. weeks later, he ran in the Boston Marathon and he broke the world record. He's now the world record holder. Wow. And then a couple months later, he ran the Chicago Marathon, broke his own world record by another five minutes and got signed by Nike. And it was just giving him that little tweak that he needed to get that extra energy, right? He was already, as I said to him, Marco, you're already a great athlete. All we're going to do is get your mind reset so that all the power that's available to you, you can then draw upon it. Yeah. And that's really what it was. And, that, and that's what I mean. Just these little tech, and I don't want to say little, I don't want to be little what you're doing, but I mean, there's a very, this is bloody important when people are doing all this extra work they're doing supplementation with you know we're constantly pushing all these opportunities and options and possibilities for things that people can do if they haven't removed the bloody handbrakes within their yeah. own physiology i mean i mean you got to do that first so you never know what you're capable of until you actually remove those bloody handbrakes and if you can just remove that event or just stop it for you can't remove anything but just stop it from bloody holding you back it'd be phenomenal to see what you could achieve in all aspects of your life uh, we are running out of time and i'm dying to stir some shit up here too <laughs> because um um there's you got what you guys are doing is miraculous um and it's it's not even debatable if it's happening i mean it's not as if you're making stuff up and you got real people with real stories ken recently um has done a film called calibrate which won awards uh, best documentary it's a phenomenal thing and it's a story about how many lives he's changed and how you're doing it. i mean you can tell us more about it but what's what blew my mind is we have an aussie aussie champion over here an absolute hero that's been getting people out of wheelchairs helping people doing all these amazing things as well as taking this neurophysics on an elite level globally and then the own the media in australia will feel the need to just bloody destroy it with apparent wankers that call themselves medical experts and none of them have read any of the data and they'll say what because they don't understand it they think it's not possible is that something don do you is that have you ever dealt with that sort of crap as well over in the states is, is that a is that a typical some, thing yeah to some degree it's because they don't understand it and you know these guys will go to medical school forever right and they're super smart yeah. But I can't tell you how many of them I'll sit down with a neurosurgeon and they've never heard this stuff that I'm talking about. Yeah. And I'll go, the only thing you work on is the head. Right? <laughs> how was this not taught in medical school? Yeah. Dr. Amen. Do you know Dr. Amen? No. From Amen University? He's a um, he's a psychiatrist, but he does spec scans. And he's now world famous. He's been doing them for over thirty years. He's blasted by the medical community you can't use spec scans spec scans are useless and he's showing all the things that show up on spec scans he's, he's very famous now but he talked about how because he was doing things that people had not heard about in that community they're going to automatically try to discredit it yeah. because and and even he talks about he said when he first started doing spec scans he would say you know when somebody had a left temporal issue Right, he would say, well, "I didn't know what happened when they had an injury to their left." I wasn't taught that in school. Mm, yeah. I'm like, "You're kidding me! How could they not teach that? They're dealing with one part of that body. Yeah. How they don't know every single fiber in that part of the brain?" It's, and I think it's almost. You ever read the book Blink? No. Nah. Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, he talks about how how we do things in a blink. Um, he took, for example, he, he talked about Pancho Gonzalez, how Pancho Gonzalez during a tennis match um, was sitting with the report, was sitting with this writer and predicted 17 out of 17 double faults as the guy tossed the ball. And he said, how do you know that? Right. He goes, I don't know. I just know it. I just knew he was going to double fault. He doesn't know because it's below his conscious awareness. And then the reason I was telling this story, though, is. Um, Cook County Hospital in Chicago was one of the other stories. They were considered the best um, uh, heart specialty trauma center. They had the best results. 
And so they were so good at it that they decided to analyze it. What were they doing that was working so well? So they started to try to analyze it and then make a whole bunch of changes to make it better. And their numbers went down because what they were doing was innate to them. They just knew how to do it. They didn't overly complicate it. They knew when they saw a heart attack, if it was a heart attack, right? And they could instinctively know it. When they started trying to add data and more data to it, they confused the process. Mm. It was the same thing with uh, Navy SEALs. They decided with Navy SEALs to stop adding all these protocols in. These guys recognized what they're seeing faster, right, than they could analyze it. It was one of the things when I was doing my research into trauma that I found something called the time slice theory. And it was developed by two scientists at the University of Zurich that said, is consciousness streaming? And most people would say, well, yeah, it's streaming. What they said is it's not. The subconscious mind is taking in all the data first because your conscious mind could not handle that amount of data and information. It processes that data and then sends time slices or pieces of it to your conscious mind in time slices. But there's a 400 millionth of a second gap in between your subconscious mind seeing it, processing it, and you're consciously aware of it. That really helped me to describe and understand what I'm doing is because what I said, what's happening in that 400 milliseconds is your survival brain's doing a Google search. Yeah. Have we seen this, heard this, smelt this before? Starts flooding in a whole bunch of data from memory, activating the nervous system, right? And you couldn't stop it if you wanted to. Yeah, and if those actions had been utilized in the past and you survived, then they get like a confirmation bias. And this is our default pathway. It's worked before. Let's do that again. And is that yes. why people, that, and that's why people have these repetitive patterns. So, and that's why I say you couldn't have done it any other way because yeah. your mind has learned a defense mechanism and is below your conscious awareness. And then by the time you're consciously aware of it, the part of your brain that has that impulse control, that prefrontal, lateral prefrontal cortex, yeah. is your gatekeeper. It gets knocked over by too much data. It gets overstimulated and can't stop it. Yeah, and there'd be a bit of a hierarchy or priority to the data. Things that trigger a, a, a memory would actually get a priority, I'd say, because they've got a, a defense mechanism that's been utilized before and can be recruited and used again. Similar to the addiction yep. stuff that we were talking about before, that we get a we get a trigger, we have a tool that our body's recognized. Um, yep. Ken, that Calibrate movie, tell us a little bit about this because people, we're going to share where, you know, we're going to talk all about it when it comes out. But So, Don, Ken recently um, had did, did a documentary on what he does. And it, where did it, well, tell us, Ken, yeah, well, I'm just well, waffling. Well, it's not, it's not my documentary. But, uh, Steve Pazbolsky, um he was writing a script for John McClane movie that um, he's trying to make a Hollywood movie based mm. around the, getting him to walk again. And um, so, of course, he had to interview me about what was happening and you know, how this happened. And he became more and more fascinated by the things that I was talking about and complexity theory yeah. and you know, what was happening when you're at the beach with John standing on the water's edge and so forth. And um, I was sort of, you know, yeah, whatever. You know, we sort of say say this and say that, whatever's, whatever's going to suit the movie. Yeah. Um, but he, he came to be really serious about it. And um, he said, so what else do you do? And I said, oh, well, we do this and we do that. And, you know, it's just my normal... Yeah day's work sort of thing and um he said well can i really think this story should be told and at first you know he was just looking about doing a little 15 minute introductory sort of thing to it and um and he said i think we need half an hour for this and <laughs> the next minute it's, it's turned into a, an hour um but it goes to, to full credit to steve like he's yeah. so devoted to to getting this film out and you know he put his career on the line i felt in in doing it and yeah I thought, wow, you know, he's really going the whole nine yards here with, with everything. And all, all he did was come and film us as we were doing things and yep. you know, do a few interviews with people. And so part of, um, you know, it was a film festival. So when it won, um, you know, the best feature film documentary at the Awareness Film Festival in LA and at all the Audience Choice Awards, you know, that it's a film festival. It's about the quality of the film, yeah, and yeah, yeah. The techniques and so forth. Um, which totally, you know, blew us away that, that it actually happened because there's some high-caliber um, other movies in there as well. Yeah. But um, 
you know, it's 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 it was just that thing. Look, it's a beautiful film. It's about yeah. people's stories. It's not a big ad for neurophysics. It's no, just no. people telling their stories about what they've accomplished, and in particular how the medical system had, had basically let them down. Um, but you know, you get that whole sense of of that people accomplishing things that were yeah. impossible. And when you've got complete people with complete spinal cord injury, and they're walking on crutches and and things like that, and they're you know uh, wave surf, big wave surfers, and all that, telling their stories and that as well. So a lot of elite athletes. So it's yeah. happy, it's sad, it's inspirational, yeah. it's funny, it has all the things that a good film should have, um, and you know that's why it's important. But when when we're in the red carpet area after they did, and all these other producers were coming up, the things that they were saying was that there was no actors, there was no yeah. script being done at all. It was just yeah. all as it unfolded and you know, very natural, and everybody just speaking their own natural way about the things that they're accomplishing and, and I think that's what sort of you know sold it to the audience basically um, yeah. yeah and that's so. what pissed me off so I mean that's what bugs me so much with the media coming on going yeah they're feeling the need for these medical experts to say that what witnessed and what these people have went through and what they achieved is not possible and therefore like discrediting the whole thing it just bugs the hell out of me yeah. and I don't want to actually we've totally run out of time and now I'm just finishing on a horrible note of these bastards in the media no but well, I, I did watch the John. I, I did watch the John McClain, um, uh sixty minutes. I guess mm. it was. It, mm. it was fascinating. I just love what you're doing. That's amazing. And yeah. because I know what I know, I know it's absolutely possible to do what you're doing. Mm. Right? No, and it's just thanks. an incredible accomplishment. Yeah, thanks, Don. Oh, I think people like you. Like I'm so. I got my Arnold Schwarzenegger and my Kobe Bryant here today from my industry, and I'm genuinely stoked to have you here i've got a lot out of this like a lot um i really want to do more and more i want to get you guys talking as much as possible because i i don't care what the motive is for people i don't care what it is but if they are not doing things holistically if we're not addressing the mind and the body and the spirit as well as every bloody other thing about the globe and the nutrition and all that sort of stuff, then we've always got some extra work that we potentially could do. And we're never going to read our, reach our genetic potential, whatever our potential is, unless we're doing a holistic approach. And I really wanted to push it. I know I'm so biased because I'm such a supplement guy. You know, I'm all about nutrients and herbs and lifestyle and foods and too. recipes. And you know, it's yeah, we are too. It's so yeah. important to cover that, but that's just the base foundation. It's just something to launch from. Without having you guys doing what you're doing and the and, and acknowledging that this is such an important aspect, there's always going to be people that are never going to get the results that they expect from all their effort and that sort of stuff. So I really wanted you guys to come through and show that there is so much more to the picture than just food, diet, supplementation, push harder, aggression, angst, you know, intensity. You just you know. So thank you guys so much for coming on. We will definitely do some more if you. If you'll come back, um, and absolutely. Brooke has given me the dirtiest looks. I think we should stop. No, it's, it is a pleasure. A pleasure. I love coming here, man. And that's the difference between ATP and lots of other companies because you know you are trying to get this balance in people's lives and, and holistically. And um, you know, it's great coming here, being part of the ATP tribe vibe. And you know, I love it. No, oh, yeah. Things. So yeah, look forward to it more. You're part of the tribe family now too, Don. You whether you like it or not. I love it. No, that's fantastic. I'm glad glad I got to meet you guys in Lake Tahoe. I'm glad to meet you, Ken, and I'm sure we'll do a lot more good things together. Likewise, Don. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We better Thanks, wrap man. it up, and an right. adult will come in and do something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye.